Well, welcome to Future Sharing, the series where we're looking in depth at how do we make the sharing economy work for everyone. I'm Pete Lydon. I'm the founder of reInvent. And we're here today with Megan Epler Wood. Now, Megan uh, is, she works within Harvard University School of Public Health, and she is the director of the International Sustainable Tourism Initiative. And she's been in this field for a long time and seen the whole growth uh, of the sustainable tourism movement. She also has just come out recently with a new book called Sustainable Tourism on a Finite Planet. Just came out in February. And we're happy to have her coming in from Vermont, if that's correct. Welcome to, to our conversation. Good Thank to have you. you. So one of the things that, w in looking at your book and looking at your past work and stuff, uh, that I think is really applicable to what we're doing is y you've got a good analysis of essentially the situation of what's happening with tourism, uh, what's the impact on the environment, what's the impact on the local people and cultures. And what's interesting, one of the things that's quite interesting about what you do is then you also uh, at least have uh, some good reflections on how the sharing economy uh, can actually deal with those two prongs of those two problems in different ways. And, and we're going to explore that for sure through the course of this interview. But why don't we start a little bit with um, taking your take, your expert take, on what is happening out there uh, in these kind of tourist destinations in terms of the growing impact on the environment and on these local folks. Uh, and and t talk a little bit about wh what you see as the problem we're solving for right now or the issue that's arising. Well, I, a couple of issues that everyone needs to be aware of is, uh, first of all, the volume of travelers is growing more rapidly than it ever has in the history of humanity. Um, and that's related to the growing uh, global middle class around the world. Uh, so we're seeing uh, that tourism for the first time ever is almost 10% of the global economy, and it's growing at double the rate of the global GDP. Now, being at Harvard University, even most of the experts that I work with there did not know that when I first came. And it comes as a big surprise to a lot of people that just our migrations around the planet are taking up that much of our economy. Now, the other thing that everyone needs to realize is that the tourism economy is a multi-sectoral economy. And so that does include aviation, for example, which is an enormously impactful industry that we can discuss as much as you would like. But then of course you get to the destinations and you have all of these other ways of servicing travelers. Cruise, of course, is the fastest growing tourism industry in the world and also, represents the largest corporation of travel and tourism in the world. So that's cruise, very Cruise liners, is that what you're saying? Is, is it One, uh, yeah, the Carnival Cruise Line is now the largest travel and tourism corporation in the world. Huh. Um, so that's very interesting and something maybe a lot of people don't know. Um, and then, of course, when you get to the ground, you have the famous hotel economy, uh, which is what I call the backbone of the tourism industry. Uh, and it is increasingly franchised. So. That's the interesting part about hotels is that it used to be uh, very much a brand exercise, but especially European hotel companies did not franchise that much. Uh, they owned their properties, but that has changed tremendously since 2008. Well, so, is, so, so, so say more about that. Why, why is the franchising of it, how does that arise as an issue as distinct from owning them full out? It's a... Uh, it basically is a legal arms range. I'm sorry. It's basically a legal arms length arrangement that uh, lowers risk and liability for the brand owner. Um, and so, uh, what happens is that, of course, you have owners in countries all around the world who uh, have licensed the brand, but depending on the agreement, they don't necessarily have to follow the sustainability mandates. And this is changing rapidly. It's morphing. Uh, but the more the corporations franchise, uh, the less it is likely that there will be consistent sustainability performance. That's that's why it's so important. And starting, you, you made a big point of saying it started in 2008. Was that related to the financial crash or what's the, what's the reason there? Absolutely. Uh, what happened in Europe was that, of course, a lot of uh, brands that were already still owning their hotels uh, lost their shirts in that time period. And so big owners like Accor and other types of European brands uh, decided that the franchising system was wise because it would lower their risk to actually losing money on individual properties. Yeah. 
So that's the financial reason, but what you're saying, the secondary effect, whether it was intentional or not, is it also um, lowered their liability or anything, or their motivation to s keep to high s sustainability standards or that kind of thing? Right? Exactly. All of the big brands, which by the way, only represent 20% of the total hotel infrastructure in the world, roughly, so that's another topic. But all of the big brands essentially have put in increasingly effective sustainability policies. But one of the inefficiencies of the franchising process is, is that even if it's included in the contract, sometimes it isn't really regulated. And so therefore an owner, uh, because they have a fair amount of latitude, can choose not to follow all of those sustainability uh, mandates. It depends on the agreement. It also does depend very much on the IT system. And I was discussing this with a, someone who is a VP for sustainability for a major hotel chain. And uh, we agree that the IT system has a lot to do with it because if they have a good one and they have green teams in the hotels around the world, they're more likely to have a better sustainability system. If they have a better IT information technology system, meaning you can distribute best practices, you can, oh, t tell me why right. is that? What's, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, sustainability depends on dozens to hundreds of indicators. Um, everything from how much laundry you're doing to how much electricity you're using per room or per unit uh, per, or per person. Um, and so therefore to manage a big hotel, you have to actually be entering into the system how you're meeting these metrics. And if you're not using a, a, you know, an IT system that's effective and encourages people to use it, uh, then you won't have the metrics. And then you're absolutely unable to manage those, uh, those sustainability indicators. Hmm, interesting. Now, you made a point again of, I mean, I'm just flushing out these issues because they're, they're, I think they're relevant here in, in terms of our larger conversation, but 20 per, only 20% of the hotel industry is, is kind of the big brands. And we're talking Marriott, Hilton, those, those kind of right. levels, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, meaning the 80% are what? Family owned or small things? Or describe what's in the rest of that 80%, which is a lot. That's a lot, yeah. Well, there's the independent brands, which aren't the big brands, and those are uh, particularly important in Asia, and you're seeing more and more of those like Shangri-La, or, you know, they're not in the top 10, but they're called an independent brand, okay? And then uh, you finally have all of the independently owned properties, even including the uh, B&Bs, the, the uh, traditional bed and breakfast. So all of those are actually even less likely to be carrying out sustainability uh, because they don't have any mandate to do so from management. And when it gets to the really small properties, surprisingly, uh, they don't even have the motivation. Uh, and this is based on academic research. Yeah, it's but, very surprising. But, it's not what people think. We'll, we'll say more about that. They don't have the motivation. What do you mean by that? Why wouldn't they be motivated to do that? Well, a lot of people who get into the B&B game are doing it as a lifestyle choice. So just think of uh, some person you know that decides, you know, gets to a beach area and thinks, you know, it'd be great to live here full time. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it be great? I always be in my flip flops and <laughs> I never have to go back, right? And if yeah, they have that. resources, they buy a place. This is not uncommon at all. Uh, so they suddenly become owners of a B and B, uh, and yet their their interest is in hospitality. Hopefully, they they love people. That's critical, and so they they love the home that they buy. But usually, they're not interested in managing indicators of sustainability. That that gets wonky, and a lot of these owners have been surveyed in very very good uh, research and. Their, their, their interest in doing that kind of more wonky indicator type of uh, management of their facility is low. I can see that motivation, but in general, let's say they're Westerners or, you know, Americans who go down to S Central America or something. Are they um, just generally, why wouldn't they be motivated in sustainable issues as opposed to screwing up the well, environment that they just bought into? Fun, but I think a, a lot of people find that running a small hotel is very, very time consuming and it's not as much fun as they thought it would be. And this is like the little inner secret of our industry that it looks like so much fun, but it's actually not. Um, and it becomes very tiresome very quickly. Uh, so unless you're a smart manager 
and you learn quickly that you're going to need good staff and you're going to have to pay them pretty well and you're going to have to build out a management team, uh, you end up with a lot of individuals that are you know, really kind of refusing to take leadership almost. Yeah, hmm. They just want to have fun. Interesting. Now, we're going to definitely talk a lot about the, the sharing economy in a broader context, but what is the difference in your view between that person who bought a B&B or something and someone who has a home down there that they want to rent out a room or, or a back cabin or for that matter, the whole thing if they're away or something? Is, is there any differentiation in those attitudes or things about that? I think so. Um, I, I, I want to fully divulge that I am an Airbnb user and also I have a room in my home. So. I, I practically in, involve myself in the use of the home sharing system. And so I have a lot of insights of, from the owner perspective and, and also from the professional perspective. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that I see as being the difference is that the booking engine and the marketing is all taken care of. Now, when I, I've done in lots of different consulting jobs in developing countries where before Airbnb, we were helping motivated owners to set up uh, eco accommodations, right? That's what a, one of the things that I do. We help them do business plans and we really help them look at what it was going to cost uh, to manage their facilities and also what kind of marketing it was going to take. It's a very serious enterprise. Uh, it takes a lot to market a new facility, even if you are just uh, an owner of one B&B, you've got to get into all of these marketing engines. You've got to have tour operators that want to book you. It's a serious enterprise, which means that you're going to be a serious business owner and you're going to have to attend to all of these management issues. Now, when you just have a room in your home, it's really very different. Um, the management is almost gone. Um, essentially, you don't have to market at all. That was the first thing I noticed about it. I was in uh, Burlington at the food co-op and a neighbor of mine said, I'm doing this home sharing thing. I was like, well, what's it like? And she said, well, I can't even keep up with the demand. She said, I, I don't have to do anything but just decide when I want people and when I don't. Well, that is absolutely nothing like uh, running a small hotel. Nothing, it's completely different. Hmm, that's fascinating. So that piece of it, the marketing, um, what other pieces about it? You, you, I think you mentioned two. There's two big differences. The reservation or? system. Okay. Um, very different. When we had to set up small hoteliers, we, you know, put out bids for reservation systems, and they're costly. Um, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to get a really good, or that this was 10 years ago, but a, a really good reservation system that could be used by travel agents. I mean, it's one thing to have people just email you, but that doesn't work for more than a year before you realize that you have to have a reservation system that hooks into the travel economy, and that means you have to pay more, okay? So that's the other difference, is that having a reservation system that is uh, something that doesn't require you to manage uh, individuals and the trade is a very, very different animal than uh, just having something that you kind of do on your computer part time. And do you think by extension that allows more of your time or resources or whatever to consider issues around sustainability or is that a little bit, I suppose it's a bridge too far to speculate or maybe not, I don't know, what, what do you think about that? I don't know that, but my um, number one thought on this question of sustainability and home sharing is that we're seeing unprecedented demand for hotel rooms worldwide. And I, I meet with the heads of sustainability of major corporations. Um, and they tell me that uh, the demand to build right now is, is very high. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new hotel infrastructure, both in major urban areas here in the United States, where we're very low on hotel rooms in places like Boston and San Francisco, right? Uh, but also in all kinds of places throughout Asia, uh, which means that you are building a tremendous amount of new infrastructure to accommodate the growth of tourism. Now, if you look at home sharing, what's happening there? Essentially, you're using existing infrastructure to accommodate people. You're not building new hotels. 
Now, if you look at what are some of the most important impacts of hotels, it's actually construction. Um, outside of, uh, you know, once it's finished, you have other things to think about, like energy, waste, and water. But before you get to that point, if you're building new hotels to accommodate the billions of travelers that are now traveling throughout the world, um, that's a very serious sustainability consideration. It, it's an unprecedented one. So my thought is, and what I said in my book, is, is that yes, there are other issues, the sense of place and how it can be regulated and how it should be managed. But from a strict sustainability perspective, there is no question that siphoning off a certain amount of this demand to existing homes is a good sustainability option. So, and just to game that out a little bit, so meaning, um, you know, the concrete that has to get laid and the tearing up of the environment and knocking down trees or the, uh, you know, all, all the energy that goes into pushing those things up, you're saying all that is, yes. this can, is a measurable known impact on the environment that is not, not good, <laughs> basically, from the beginning. It's, it's the highest impact you can have uh, compared to using infrastructure that's already in place. When you said unprecedented, I don't know if you just used that word, but what do you unpack what you meant by that literally unprecedented, meaning the scale or how many of these are happening or, or this something, what's different well, now that's demand. unprecedented? Oh, the the demand, demand for new hotel rooms is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. so, and so, so therefore, if a portion of that can go to existing uh, homes, I think that that is a very positive development. So, mm -hmm. so just to make it clear to the, the people watching this, so, so you, the, the, the first mover is you've got a rising middle class all over the world, you know, basically, particularly in China and these other places. Second mover is those middle class can now travel. And so you've got this push out that's all going all over the world to these new places. And, and, and internally too, domestically also. And they're mm -hmm. internally domestically. And so that's then pushing pressure on creating the infrastructure, which is building these hotels, which is bad from the beginning, this more construction, but um, but also all the stuff around that. So, so that's an interesting thing. So basically it's, unless at some level it's inevitable, maybe, maybe inevitable is too strong a word, that if you're going to have this growing middle class and the ability of open borders and people traveling, that you're going to need to accommodate those numbers somehow. That's right. And so the question is, how do you solve that in the most sustainable way? Is that the That's right. fair That's enough? That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. There is no other way to look at it as far as I can uh, discern. Uh, of course, uh, there are many people that are very concerned about the impacts of sharing existing city space. And we can talk about that. But I'm only saying that you have to acknowledge this larger phenomenon when you talk about all of these factors. So, so meaning when you say sharing city space, you meaning there's issues outside of tourism and sustainable tourism, you're saying that have to do with the sharing economy? Is that what you're talking about? When no, you I mean, sharing uh, inner city space for the purposes of tourism is creating an uproar in places like Amsterdam and Barcelona. And uh, they see this as a form of an invasion on their cultural uh, health and well-being of the community. So that's a form of sustainability that cannot be ignored. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at just straight out environmental sustainability, there is no question that sharing existing city space is good for the environment. Hmm. Okay. So let's just, since you've introduced this, let's take the second foot or pillar of this conversation, which is the impact on local people, local cultures, whether it's Amsterdam, a very sophisticated kind of Western space, or, you know, out there in some ancient monument on the edge of nowhere kind of place. There is this, uh, like you say, set aside the environmental thing. We'll, we've talked about a little bit about that. We will do more of that. But talk about what is, what's happening out there with that, um, the impact on the local people and the cultures, and from your perspective, from your vantage point. Well, um, the whole idea of how to accommodate foreigners in foreign destinations um, is always a challenge, uh, especially when you start packing more and more people into an existing place. Uh, if you see, for example, the uproar over cruise tourism, what, it, what is really causing that? Um, outside of the size of the ships, I think that's part of it, 
And the other is the number of people that are getting off simultaneously and what's called swamping local uh, places. So uh, when a cruise ship arrives in Venice, you know, tens of thousands of people arrive simultaneously, as many as 30,000, I understand. Uh, so you get uh, all of a sudden an enormous number of people in a small historic cultural place simultaneously, and they're more or less drowning out all of the local cultural activities. Uh, people who might have gone to the square, for example, to do other things just don't go there anymore. So it completely changes our perception of place. And uh, that's very important as we now consider how to manage uh, the growth of the, of the tourism economy. How do we manage uh, the, the percentage of, of foreigners or people who are not from that place coming into a new destination and do it well? And there's a lot of questions that have to be asked about that, a lot. Uh, so one is how many should really be allowed, frankly, to go into a historic city center at the same time. Uh, already, we're starting to see regulations about this. Uh, when it comes to overnight stays, uh, I think cities will have to think about it. Um, how much of a percentage of your historic city center do you want to be in hotel rooms? And that could include, yes, share, shared room space, because it gets to a point where nobody lives there anymore, except for people who are visiting. Well, obviously, that's having a major impact on the, the life of your city center. So these are all things that go well beyond the sharing economy. I think they're, that people need to think more holistically at this point, because we really have to understand how many people are not only traveling now, but how quickly those numbers are going to rise in the future. So we'll say, say more about that, because uh, meaning these trends that we're seeing, particularly with this growth of the global middle class, there's still a lot more running room coming, is, is what you're implying there. 20 to 30 years of solid growth. Mm -hmm. Have you studied that with numbers or something? Or are you yeah, just kind oh of? Yes, yes. I have a bunch of numbers here. Um, you know, for just an example, in India alone, uh, they're seeing domestic tourism grow 11 to 12 percent in the last year or so. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, of very good numbers. Uh, China. Uh, total uh, became number one in total tourism trips at 3.69 billion in 2011. Uh, so uh, we're seeing of uh, these regions of the world uh, growing very rapidly because of this growth of the middle class, and they're they're traveling a lot domestically and also internationally. So, so when yeah. the number you just mentioned for China, um, the 3.6. Th that's got to be including internal. Domestic. Oh, sorry. So, yes, correction. Uh, so, China became the number one in total trips in 2011. Okay. Total trips uh, globally, you're talking about? Internationally. Um, and then, if you add the estimates that we've looked at for domestic plus international tourism in China, we're seeing 3.69 billion total trips per year. So, that's someone who's maybe making it in Shanghai, wants to go to. Sichuan or something, that's right. counted as a trip, but the same one going to Japan would also count as a trip. That, that's what you're saying in the whole thing. Yeah, so often what we see is, is that uh, domestic travel is triple the, the number of international trips. That's a very rough uh, indicator. But in the case of China, we, I, in my book, I actually came up with the, the specific figures for 2011. And, and that's how I came up with and, that. And the Chinese percentage of all global travelers outside, not internal stuff, but outside, it, it, do you know what the percentage of their their percentage is now? I don't have that right in front of me, but yeah. they became number one in total, like, you know, foreign uh, international trips in 2011. Wow, so that's crazy. So there's more people from China are traveling than people from the United States. Or any country is what you're saying. Overseas, yeah. Well, just anywhere, but certainly U.S. or any other country. It's pretty remarkable. Um, these are things that I think people are, it's sort of, there's a tsunami of travel going on and, and people are looking at isolated anecdotal incidents. And so what my book tries to do is put this within a larger framework of what we really need to be thinking about. That sounds terrific. Um, now, um, so you talk about the big cruise ships, which I don't know, every, many people have see as 
problematic, if not preposterous kind of situation. But um, talk about kind of the off-road stuff. You know, like somebody's like a village that has an old monument someplace in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a space that doesn't accommodate big ships or, for that matter, even, you know, highways and stuff. W what's going on in those kind of spaces? Same idea that you just, you're getting more and more just kind of Land Rovers getting out there or, or whatever it takes to get people into these places? Well, that's really my stock and trade. Uh, as an ecotourism expert, I worked in those kinds of rural environments for some 20 years. And um, it depends. Uh, you have to have a terrific attraction in order to get those kinds of people to come to your site. So uh, Machu Picchu, which is a rural site, for example, is got all the tourists they could possibly ever manage. But if you go an hour north of Machu Picchu, there's nobody, right? So um, there's huge swaths of rainforest in Peru, Colombia, where I just was and uh, of course Ecuador and you know in regions like that you're going to see just small groups. Uh, Africa is a very interesting case. Uh, I'm working now on a case study of a, a leading uh, tour operator called Wilderness Safaris for Harvard Business School to look at how are they managing this uh, proposition of how many tourists are coming, how are they managing them responsibly, and how are they growing their business. And Frankly, they're doing very well, but are they dealing with an overwhelming number of travelers in Southern Africa? No, they aren't. But if you go up to Kenya, it's another story entirely uh, because it's the most established safari destination in the world. More people decide to go there. Uh, so tourism is very trendy. It's a, a very trendy kind of business, and it depends where you are, whether you're going to get this tsunami of travelers or not. Now, would you say the people in this more eco travel and getting to the more remote places, are they usually the kind of people that at least their mentality is to try to travel lightly and not disrupt it in the same way? Or, or do you find it's the same mentality of just, hey, give me my, you know, whatever, my, my creature comforts, it really wherever varies. I am? It really varies. I, of course, if a company's going to call themselves eco travel and they're not, that's very unfortunate. But I think more often what happens is that a company starts out thinking, I'm gonna do some safari travel. And then they just start to grow. And then the numbers become more important to them uh, than like saving the animals. So that, that happens a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess what you're kind of saying, at least from your analysis, is that there's these common destinations that are just getting overrun on all the metrics and having impact on the environment as well as the cultures and the people. Yeah. But there is still, you know, relatively large swaths of the, the world that's haven't, or, or at least in manageable situation right now. Mm -hmm. But you're worried that it, that that's in the next 10, 20, 30 years, those places as well will, will get more overrun. Is that one? Well, we'll see it. Uh, for example, I worked in Bangladesh for one of my assignments and that's an interesting case. I mean, when is the last time you thought of going there? But surprisingly, um, Lonely Planet named it as the hottest new tourism destination while I was working there. Uh, so again, it gets to what's trendy and what is the industry trying to make trendy, which is part of it. Uh, so of course I ran into travelers there, but uh, the number one uh, source of market demand were Bengalis. And uh, I was working on the longest beach in the world, which is down on the Bay of Bengal and it's called the Teknaf Peninsula. And there was a building boom down there. Talk about the impact on uh, people's livelihoods, the local livelihoods and stuff. Now, in some respects, um, you know, there's particularly in, in countries that, uh, you know, don't have big manufacturing bases or other kind of sides of the economy. I mean, it's, it could really bring in, that, you know, interesting infusion of in, uh, in, uh, capital. But on the other hand, it's, uh, does it all get distributed in the way, or are you, are you seeing it as a, as a boon always, or a positive thing, or are you seeing a kind of a mixed bag, or, or some real negative impacts on, on just the people who live there? Well, I think it, it's mostly positive when it comes to employment. Um, tourism now represents one out of every 11 jobs in the world, if you look at the whole tourism economy. Um, and it is especially friendly towards folks who don't have a lot of uh, technical training. Uh, so you can get into the tourism industry from the bottom up. 
more easily than some other industries. And it's also, without question, very friendly towards women. Uh, there is a lot of uh, very good opportunities for women to even own businesses in tourism, uh, many of whom go into restaurants, especially if you include restaurants uh, that are serving tourists. Uh, you will see more women bosses in places like Africa, according to the World Bank. Uh, so that's a really terrific benefit. Uh, so from an economic development perspective for uh, countries that have poverty or high poverty rates, it's considered to be a really important and effective economic development tool. Now, that is a great thing, uh, but the, it can't happen uh, without some significant effort on the part of government. Uh, again, if you just allow this to happen on its own uh, without any kind of proper regulation training and or retraining, it's not as effective. And of course, as a result, the certain kinds of more experienced or wealthy investors and owners tend to take over and also the benefits don't spread as well. It's the same as what we're facing in the United States right now by way of how do we spread the wealth. There really is no difference in any country and there can be arguments over how to effectively achieve that. Uh, but I think with tourism, what is incredibly important to understand, for example, is, is that you need excellent infrastructure. You have to have pretty good roads, at least serviceable, um, and you have to have uh, a good internet. Internet is really important for tourism. Uh, so if you get into these more remote areas where you don't have any uh, signal or really can't get online, uh, that's gonna cut you off from the tourism economy. Uh, so there's some issues that need to be considered uh, by government before you just assume that tourism will take off on its own. So, so that's interesting about the internet. So meaning that consumers, the tourists, are, have now gotten to the point where you app, you have to have internet basically to be no, on the map? No, it's partly the booking and res ah. reservations are critical in this business, as I was pointing out. Um, there is the informal tourism economy and it can be fun. And uh, we've all done that where you've just met someone by the roadside and uh, figured they're gonna be good and you end up going with them to their family's village or something like that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great part of the tourism experience. I've done it myself many times. Um, but that's not the formal tourism economy. Even in villages, uh, it's nice to have an eco lodge. Okay, let's just say I love going to eco lodges personally uh, because they can be the base of activities where you have terrific guides. And so uh, then you get this wonderful set of perspectives from people that have actually been trained to tell you everything about their village and, and, and their environment, which I highly recommend. But that eco lodge really needs the internet to operate because they need to have reservations um, and they need to be able to communicate quickly if there's any kind of problem, for example, or of course, if you need to medevac someone out, uh, all of these things require communication. So roads, communications, um, from a government kind of investment point of view, um, that's interesting. Now, uh, so let's layer the back in the sharing economy into this situation. So if you had a place that had a big hotel employing, you know, a certain amount of people in that hotel, but also owned by somebody who's whatever, man own it from a foreign corporation or something, as opposed to more of a distributed kind of way to, to think about it. Uh, just talk to me about what you see the differentiation there or the sustainability of it or the kind of, how does it deal with these issues we just laid out here at distributing well, from uh, the assets and stuff? employment and economic development perspective, I haven't actually studied that as much, so I don't have the same statistics. But um, I would say clearly that it's going to create a more distributed form of income into uh, areas of the community where previously never were in tourism at all. Right? It, I mean, it, being, it being the sharing economy. You're saying a sharing economy right. approach. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the sharing economy is creating a greater distribution of revenue to more individuals who were never in the tourism economy before. That's that that could not be contested. Um, and so the question is, is that economically beneficial? Um, 
I would argue yes. Uh, because many of these people are doing it on a part-time basis. Uh, and that's always good for economic development. Um, if you can augment your income uh, and also put that towards say children's education is something we always look towards uh, as being something in other countries that doesn't come free, okay? It's very, very common that families are scraping it together even in the, lower, uh, you know, even the middle class, right? Uh, it may be the lower middle class, but they have to put those school fees together and this type of thing. So that kind of extra form of income going into communities, I would venture to guess, uh, would be very helpful by way of pro providing more stability uh, in uh, the local social environment, the local community environment. Hmm. Now, um, the only transformation that I see is this arm's length Airbnb ownership uh, structure that's emerging on its own very rapidly. Um, and that is, of course, where owners are renting out numerous apartments uh, without their presence. Uh, they're basically becoming hoteliers uh, and by leasing apartments and renting them to Airbnb. That changes the formula a little bit, and I believe that it is correct to regulate that. Changes the formula. Say more about that. I mean, I could in, uh, infer what you're saying, but s say more about what you mean by that. What, what's di why is that a bad thing? And tell, tell me more about that. Well, the first way I describe it is, is that mom and pop are sending their kid to school with some extra room in their house, right? Now, that's the ultimate in a really nice example of how you're helping out people in a distributed income kind of way. But when you start getting smart business people, they're always gonna figure out how to accumulate wealth into their pockets. And that can actually help to displace people who may have lived in those apartments. And that we all know is one of the primary complaints, and I covered this in my book, uh, for places like San Francisco, uh, where there's a big argument over how many uh, owners should be accumulating apartments without uh, physical presence. Uh, same with Barcelona, places like this. They're looking at now, maybe they should regulate that so that an owner can only have so many apartments or uh, that they have to regularly uh, at least pay certain types of taxes or because they're essentially becoming hoteliers. They're not doing it just to share their home anymore. You said, sorry, just to hear, you said hotel lets, is that what you said? Did you call no, it? No, hotel yays. So if you start, let's say I, I bu let's say I lease out 20 apartments in one apartment building. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I put them all in an Airbnb engine. I, I would call that person the owner of a dis unusual type of a hotel, but really no different than a hotel. Yeah. As opposed to uh, somebody who's just renting out their room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, I totally get it. No, I'm just, I'm just curious how you frame that. Um, and again, I'm neutrally just trying to hear this whole thing out. Um, but it is true. That's definitely one of the big issues there. Now, you said you actually have. Do you have like a, a literally a room in your house, so you're in the house all the time if you rent it, or is it a separate structure? No, it's in my home. I have a Victorian oh. house, and um, I uh, live in uh, a walkable downtown, and I am basically interested in sharing it <laughs> well, say, say, I, say, say more about that say more why well i'm proud of my community um i like meeting people who are coming from all over the, the world and um i am a traveler myself who have been in many places around the world and so i therefore know what it takes to give somebody a really good feeling when they stay somewhere and, and I actually, it's just this feeling of almost returning the favor out there for travelers, like throwing it back karma wise uh, to the, the greater good. Uh, I really believe in uh, sharing in that sense. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. And uh, I, I do think that that kind of uh, thought that we could all share resources and we didn't all have to have our own thing, everything had to be private, is something that I, I grew up with. So I, I 
I, I like that and I believe it and I enjoy having people in my home. And we've been talking, um, which, which is great to hear that. Uh, and I had no idea actually when we were, I was, anyhow, that's, that's an interesting evolution here of just the conversation. Um, but I just want to distinguish, between, so you've experienced that in the house thing and that's a pretty slam dunk. Nobody seems to have a problem with that. What about this idea of if you left your house while you're on this trip to Peru and you let your house be sh shared by someone, but you're not there. Do you feel the same about that, that kind of uh, calculation, or is that closer? Is that a problematic situation at all? I think it can be. Again, these are not licensed hotel facilities, right? Um, and so uh, even if you are paying taxes, they, we're still not going through the process of licensing ourselves. And therefore, that means that from a zoning perspective, nobody's told me uh, or had a, a chance to say, I want, I want a hotel next door, right? Nobody's been able to weigh in on that. Uh, I'm just doing it. And, and the reason that I can do it is because I'm always here. Um, and so if anybody has a problem, like my neighbors, I'm going to be the first person to answer their questions. Uh, if I'm in Peru, uh, that's not happening, and I really think that my neighbors would be rightfully upset with me. Hmm. Well, so so have you ever thought of some model regulations or principles or anything that that's kind of your own thoughts as an expert in the whole space and actually a hands-on user in that in the c case of home sharing? Have you ever thought of the kind of guidelines or any ways that people should think about that? If uh, it sounds like one of them is you shouldn't be able to have tons of units at the same time. But any, any thoughts on other kind of ideas that, that's useful to kind of wrap your hands around? Well, I'm, I, I really haven't tried to do a regulatory framework for this. I've only read about what other cities are trying to do. Uh, in a perfect world, I wish everyone would just share rooms. I really do. I, I, that's a perfect world and where everyone is doing it because they're genuinely sharing. But that's not what's happening. And it's already advanced too quickly for that to be the solution. Right? So we have to acknowledge that there's going to be owners who are not there. But it's just a question of how many apartments is appropriate in any one area. And that gets down to zoning. It really does. Um, I just stayed in Santa Fe in an Airbnb. Um, it was a carriage house. Uh, People are now renovating without question in order to get that extra income property uh, right next to them. So this was a, a couple who had put in uh, and renovated two carriage houses. They were running it very professionally, more like a real bed and breakfast. Um, but it was all being done through Airbnb and we're seeing that more and more now. So at a certain point, that looks to me like a hotel, right? It, it's a very nice situation for them. I don't have any problem with them doing it, but I do think that zoning has to come into play when it comes to how many folks are doing that in any one area. Hmm. I do. Well, I think that it has to be restricted. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, we're looking at the future sharing. We could see kind of experimentation in that for sure. Um, okay. A uh, couple of things. So let's take it back a little bit more to the big picture. We, we had been talking about home sharing. W when you see um, other forms of sharing economy, like ride sharing or car sharing, or you know, increasingly there's sharing of assets that are out there. Um, do you yeah. see any any reflections on that? Those aspects of the sharing economy beyond the kind of the, the, the home sharing kind of phenom? Well, yeah, of course, I'm very familiar with the the whole car sharing phenomenon, and then. I've heard Light of yacht sharing. sharing and other things. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, the idea of doing it in principle is great. Um, it, it's giving access uh, to assets that people didn't have before um, and giving people the opportunity to share assets that they weren't able to do before. And I think there's nothing wrong with that in principle. But obviously, uh, when it comes to, you know, the ride sharing economies, it's had a lot more questionable uh, uh, ethical questions associated with it in terms of now, just today, it was in the paper for the ride sharing economy. Are they actually paying taxes appropriately or is the driver actually paying the taxes on behalf of the company? So these are uh, troubling questions when you get into who's paying for what uh, and how much is the 
uh, you know, cause the sharing economy, let's face it, it's run by mega corporations. And those mega corporations are making an extraordinary amount of money on this. So it's not like hippie collectives here or like local food cooperatives, which I think are a much better example of the sharing economy would be your local farmer's market or food cooperative is a much better example of that because it's been structured, right? In which everyone is actually sharing the profits as well. Mm -hmm. I just finished writing that up. <laughs> so, and also we have a lot more access to the governance of those, uh, of those types of enterprises. So with cooperatives or, I've studied cooperatives a lot, uh, and they are a terrific example of the genuine sharing. And, and cooperatives could run ride sharing uh, or home sharing. It's just that these enterprises with their, their capacity to do great uh, uh, solutions on the internet uh, have a gigantic lead on that, and I doubt that will ever disappear. So I think in some ways, the idea of the sharing economy is a little bit of a a false concept uh, because you know, the large majority of the benefits financially are only going to the owners of the of the internet solutions, right? And so those things really have to be thought about for the future of the sharing economy. And I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that, but I just think it's important for us to recognize that we're helping to build something uh, that is by participating ourselves individually in this idea of sharing, which I like, as I said, but a good portion of that is not being shared and it's being taken by, you know, large, very large corporations. So, so okay, so then, so good, and there's some good points there. Now, so now we've got, let's say there's, there's those, the home sharing core companies, although enabling these hosts and other people around, and you've got these big um, hotel companies and the carnival cruise people and stuff like that. So uh, going back to the original framing of this interview about sustainable tourism, mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on um, how to rethink that whole space and, 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 and in what ways, how, how do we avoid... A kind of <laughs> um, I mean, it looks like we're tracking into increasingly difficult situation here unless something gets changed some point here. And I'm just, do you have some thoughts on what are the kinds of things we have to start to change? You mentioned for one, maybe limiting the number of people in a city center or, I mean, potentially, what do we do with these cruise ships? I mean, is there ways you could l specifically regulate them? or? Is there a way to think about construction around how many new hotels can go up? Or I, I don't know. It starts to get into this whole. What, what's what's some thoughts on solutions, kind of to kind of move uh, this space forward? Right. So yeah, that gets into some of the conclusions of my book and and a look at uh, the question of our destinations, uh, which are the places that we're visiting generically around the world, um, and how are we going to manage those in future? Uh, so. Uh, the way that I look at it is, is that our destinations are essentially shared, first of all. They're shared by the people that live there together with the people that are visiting the place. And so they have to be thought of as not the asset of either the visitor or of the local people. Uh, it's a kind of a shared um, mutual benefit system that has to be really the goal. And, and I've seen that work in small examples around the world. It, it can work is the encouraging news. But when, once it starts to grow out, uh, out of a smaller situation into a very larger situation where many more people are coming, things start to get out of order, as I was saying. Uh, too many tourists are flooding the area. Uh, there's a lack of regulatory power in order to manage that at the local level. And revenues start going to just the big players. I mean, essentially, that's what happens. So uh, how do you change that? I think we have to, first of all, acknowledge that we can't just keep moving on and just leaving the places behind that we don't like anymore, right? There's this idea that, oh, I was there already, but I don't go there anymore, right? Well, that's unfortunate because it's a, an acknowledgement that in fact, every single place that we develop for tourism is going to be ruined. And uh, that's what, that is the central thesis of my book. We're living on a finite planet now. 
uh, we'll have to go into space pretty soon in order to find places that are completely untouched by humankind. And so therefore we have to think through in a completely different way how we manage our destinations. So, so what are my recommendations? Well, I looked a lot at the question of the flow of revenue from tourism. To me, it's often about money and a little bit less about how much uh, responsibility everybody brings to the table. I wish it was more about how much responsibility we bring to the table, but unfortunately that can change so quickly. One, you know, one player leaves government or a business CEO leaves and suddenly the responsibility factor just disappears. So I don't count on that anymore. <laughs> so what I look, look at and what I've really had the opportunity to do at Harvard, and I've just been there seven years, I used to be in the NGO world and as a consultant, I looked at this, but this gave me the opportunity to look at, at it much more systematically. Uh, and what I found is, is that the money is going to the wrong places. Uh, so our tourism money is all being siphoned away to places that we would be, we would be surprised to know. Like you, you explain that more meaning to, when you say to other places, meaning other people or other companies or what, what do you mean by? Well, the, the best example that I like to give is uh, the hotel tax. Uh, when you enter a country, you also pay an airport tax. It's on every ticket, uh, but also in almost all countries now, we're also paying a percentage and it can be small, like one or 2% or it can be as much as 15% uh, of tax. Okay, that's every time I stay anywhere, almost anywhere in the world, I'm paying a tax. And the question is, where are those taxes going? Now we need much more information and research on this. And I've been pushing my colleagues at Harvard, for example, to look at this more. Uh, but what we know from studies in places like Mexico or places where we have access to records is that uh, in fact, it could be as much as 80% of tourism taxes are going to marketing tourism. Uh, so the essential system is is that we need to market our country. So let's just take Mexico. Uh, we need more travelers because that's gonna create more economic development. It's gonna help poor people drive more employment, all those good things that we talked about. And also we'll build more hotels to accommodate them. And that also benefits all kinds of people in their system. But uh, the problem is, is, is that none of that money is being diverted back to the actual maintenance of these areas. Now, what does that really mean when I say maintenance? Now, the first time I really did a study like this was in Belize on an island called Ambricus Key. And uh, we actually, with students, looked at where the money was going, okay? And what we found actually is, is that all of the tax money was going to the capital and then it was being reallocated for marketing other parts of the country. Uh, because all of the states of Belize wanted to have what Ambergris Key had, which was lots of tourists. And they didn't see why Ambergris Key should get any of that money back, okay? So uh, the mayor, when I was there, I was actually working as a consultant for the government, came to one of my consultation meetings and she was very upset. And she was outraged that she wasn't getting any of this tax money back. So we decided to look at it with students. And what we found was, in fact, she was, she was absolutely right. And that, for example, just one of many examples, uh, their sewage treatment system uh, was on, on a pay-as-you-go basis. It had been privatized, uh, but that might be okay for the poor uh, part of the island, but then all of these immigrants had moved there in order to work in the hotel. So you often have this with tourism. Little known fact is, is that you have the residents of the hotels, you have the management of the hotels, and then you have all of the service uh, employees. This is also true in Cancun. Um, and they don't get any service. So the, the sewage treatment, you know, does not get out to that community. And as a result, you're seeing all kinds of effluent going right, you know, into their streams and right out to their coral reef. And as a result, uh, over time, their coral reef could be very heavily affected. And that is their number one tourism attraction. So what we're saying is, huh, basically we're putting all our money towards the marketing of a place and none of our money to make sure that it remains well maintained. And actually, the more I look at that idea, 
And the more I check it with country after country, uh, the more we look at statistics, uh, we find that that is actually uh, a very, very big problem that needs to be corrected. So you can see some kind of recorrection of that or potentially additional taxes that would go directly to... Um, we don't like, I don't like to talk about additional taxes too much because that gets people up in arms right away. Uh, but what I do like to talk about are existing taxes uh, because we're paying a very big, it's a multi-billion dollar industry out there that's marketing tourism. And all I'm saying is, do we actually need that anymore? I'm not saying we're going to eliminate it. But on the other hand, this is governments. I'm not talking about business. This is governments that are marketing tourism to their countries. And with the way the tourism economy works now, very digital, all of these uh, businesses around the world actually have access to these digital booking engines and reservation systems now. I'm not sure that they actually need all this marketing anymore. Hmm. Uh, and yet that's where all of our money is going. Now, just think if we took even 20% of this multi-billion dollar exercise and put it towards, for example, more green spaces. Uh, this is something that often disappears in places, you know, but the classic, there used to be cabanas here and now it's just wall-to-wall -wall hotels. Well, these are things that happen because they allow the real estate sector to just build out without any regulation, but they also don't protect green spaces. Uh, there's examples in the Mediterranean where people no longer had access to their beaches uh, and actually they had to remove hotels in order to redevelop these areas. So uh, there's lots of examples of where tourism has gone wrong, but if they had invested more in the actual development process to maintain beautiful areas while they're developing, and give local people also access to affordable housing, this is the other angle that is important to explore, uh, you'll be able to maintain well, environmentally beautiful places with cultures that are still alive. Hmm. Well, we're coming up to the end of this um, interview here, which is a fascinating interview. Um, I'm just thinking as we think towards the end here, um, you talked a little bit about how government can think about this differently. We've talked a little bit about different uh, regulations, thinking about taxes. Um, what about the business community, um, and maybe not the l super local businesses, but um, you talked about the housing, cruise, the big platform companies and the sharing economy and stuff. A any thoughts on if you had to give them some advice or thinking about um, uh, what you'd recommend, and potentially even with an idea of a, a brewing backlash if something isn't done here pretty soon, uh, whether it's through government, their own efforts, or whether it's through the, the companies themselves moderating. Any, any thoughts on what they might do? Corporations can do a lot here. Um, right now, the responsible corporations in the travel and tourism sector are measuring their impacts, okay? They're thinking about this already. Uh, in fact, at their last major conference, uh, they did a survey and found that over 50% of travel and tourism corporate leaders are worried about what's called over tourism, which essentially means destinations becoming too crowded. So the business community is thinking about this. Uh, but what I recommend in my book is, is that they get more involved in public private decision making. Right now, there's been a breakdown on that. There's been very little trust. Uh, governments are known for just, you know, wanting their money essentially, and then they get to do with it what they want. And businesses want their money, and they get to do what they want. At times, businesses are sheltering their income without question off offshore, so that they're not showing quite as much tax dollars onshore. So there has to be an acknowledgement that we need more financial wherewithal to protect places. Uh, protected areas are very under budgeted around the world. They don't have enough money to actually manage tourists uh, and they don't have the capacity to do it right. Uh, shoreline areas where you, know, you don't have proper beaches or dunes uh, need reinvestment. I mean, especially as climate change is really starting to uh, rear its ugly head, especially in all these coastal areas, 
there's going to have to be a concerted effort with both government and the private sector to start looking at what they can do to shore up the enormous investment that they both have in protecting their shorelines. Uh, so there's a lot of cooperation that is required now. And I believe that, personally, I believe an international summit meeting is needed, needed about it. And that uh, we should have uh, different, you know, very concerted working groups uh, with academia involved so that uh, we can do measuring in a harmonized fashion around the world to look at where the real trouble spots are and start to look at where investment should be made. And we, we really can't afford to be messing around on this. Um, it's happening fast and uh, some real resolution is needed. Well, I think that's a good place to stop, although I could continue talking here for quite a while longer with all we have here. Um, I do want to just say it's been a terrific talk here with Megan Epler Wood. She's the author of Sustainable Tourism in a Finite Planet, and uh, she's been giving some of her thoughts there. It's a really interesting kind of way to rethink on a fundamental level uh, the whole space of sustainable tourism, as well as the kind of level of the role of uh, the sharing economy in that. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to us and hope to talk to you again. Thank you, Peter, for having me.